Hi, I'm Sylvan Kaufman. I'm at Atkins Arboretum today in Ridgely, Maryland, and I want to introduce you to the tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera. The majestic tulip tree can reach more than 100 feet tall, with tall straight trunks crowned with a pyramid of branches. Donald Colross Petey, in A Natural History of Trees, writes, But despite the splendor of its dimensions, there is nothing overwhelming about the tulip tree but rather something joyous in its springing straightness, in the candle-like blaze of its sunlight flowers, in the fresh green of its leaves, which being more or less pendulous on long slender stalks, are forever turning and rustling in the slightest breeze. This gives the tree an air of liveliness, lightening its grandeur. So even a very ancient tulip tree has no look of old about it, for not only does it make a swift growth in youth, but in maturity it maintains itself marvel marvelously free of decay. Liriodendron tulipifera is in the magnolia family, and looking at the flowers, you can see the resemblance to magnolias. The name Liriodendron comes from the Greek words lirion, meaning a lily, and dendron, meaning a tree for the flowers. The only other species of Liriodendron is the Chinese tulip tree, Liriodendron chinense. Green bracts protect the flower bud. If you look at the tulip tree flower, you can see that it has six petals that are sort of a pale yellow with a bright orange color at the base. And then underneath that are the sepals. There are many anthers with pale yellow pollen and a central stigma. The elongated floral axis or receptacle holds the stigmas. The flowers produce abundant nectar, but the stigmas are only receptive to pollen for 12 to 24 hours. Once they turn brown, they can no longer be pollinated. The nectar attracts all kinds of insect pollinators, flies, beetles, honeybees, and bumblebees, as well as hummingbirds. Tulip tree honey is prized among beekeepers. Nevertheless, usually only a fraction of seeds form due to poor pollination success. Because the trees flower in spring after the leaves leaf out, in the forest it can be hard to see the flowers or the seeds until wind or squirrels knock some to the ground. Trees are so large and produce so many flowers that even if relatively few seeds form per flower, plenty of viable seeds still mature. One study estimated seed production at 300,000 to 600,000 seeds per acre. The seeds are held in cone-like clusters of wind-dispersed samaras. Look up at a tulip tree in winter, and it looks like the branches are a candelabra holding up its seeds. The winged samaras gradually fall off the central axis from fall into winter. It's a good thing that lots of seeds are produced because they're eaten by cardinal, goldfinch, Carolina chickadee, and purple finch, as well as by fox squirrel, gray squirrel, red squirrel, white-footed mouse, and woodland deer mouse. Any seeds that escape predation can remain viable for four to seven years before germinating. Seedlings germinate best where there has been some disturbance that exposes bare soil, such as after a fire, flood, or after logging. Young trees go rap grow rapidly under favorable conditions. The trees range from Vermont and Southern Ontario, Canada, south to Florida and Louisiana. You find trees growing in bottomlands and slopes of the coastal plain, as well as on the rocky slopes of the Appalachians. You often hear of tulip trees referred to as tulip poplar, yellow poplar, or white poplar. The leaves tremble in the breeze the way poplars do but otherwise poplars are not even a close relative. The leaves have a distinctive shape often described as a cat's face, and they're attached to the stems by long petioles. The leaves are eaten by several butterfly and moth caterpillars, including the eastern tiger swallowtail, the tulip tree beauty moth, whose caterpillar is an inchworm, as well as luna moths, tulip tree silk moths, promethea and cecropia moths. This leaf miner moth is also fairly common. It is also host to the tulip tree aphid, Illinois liriodendra. The honeydew excreted by the aphids in summer months can build up and grow sooty mold, looking like a layer of sticky gray ash on the twigs and leaves. The leaves turn bright yellow in fall. 
The bark of young trees is thin, scaly, and grayish in color. As trees mature, the bark thickens and develops deep furrows. Twigs are yellow-green when they first begin to grow, turning reddish-brown with pale lenticels their first winter. The half-inch long buds look a little like a brown duck's bill. Sometimes along the trunk you can find the evenly spaced holes of a sap sucker. They eat insects stuck in the sap as well as lapping up the sap itself. The light soft wood has been used for many purposes. Some Native Americans called it canoe wood as a single buoyant log could be hollowed out to make a canoe and supposedly Daniel Boone used a tulip tree canoe to carry himself and his family west to the frontier. This picture is from a story of how Daniel Boone's daughter Jemima and two friends were floating on a river in a canoe in Kentucky and were abducted by Cherokee and Shawnee tribal members, perhaps in retaliation for the settlers having failed to observe Cherokee treaties. Native Americans also used the tree to make cordage and used parts of it medicinally. European pioneers used the logs to make homes, the bark for shingles, and they lined wells with the wood as it would not impart a taste to the water. It was also used to make crates for perishable food and shipping boxes. The lumber is still widely used for making inexpensive furniture, plywood, pallets, molding, and interior doors. The sapwood is pale, but the heartwood is a yellow-green color that turns brown as it ages. Tulip trees are also pulped to make paper. In my fine woodworking classes, the wood was used to make test pieces before completing a, pe a piece of furniture. The trees have long been appreciated for their ornamental value as well. In the journal of a tutor to a wealthy Virginia family, Philip Vickers Fithian wrote in 1774, due east of the great house are two rows of tall, flourishing, beautiful poplars, beginning on a line drawn from the school to the wash house these rows are something wider than the house and are about 300 yards long, at the easternmost end of which is the great road leading through Westmoreland to Richmond. These rows of poplars form an extremely pleasant avenue, and at the road, through them, the house appears most romantic. Tulip trees were sent over to Europe as early as 1687, admired for their form and beautiful flowers. Marie Antoinette loved the trees and had them planted at Versailles in the 1780s. Several stood until a huge storm on December 26, 1999. They have since been replanted. Several long-lived tulip trees play an important role in American history. On the St. John's campus in Annapolis, Maryland, a tulip tree served as a liberty tree, a rallying point to protest the Stamp Act of 1765. That tree lived until it was damaged by Hurricane Floyd in 1999. A tree in Inwood Park in Manhattan was supposedly the site of the sale of the island from the Lenape tribe to Peter Minuit, director of the Dutch New Netherland colony in 1626. After heroic efforts to save the tree in 1912, including pouring concrete into hollow areas, now not considered to be such a good idea, the tree succumbed to a storm in 1933. It was thought to be 280 years old. They are the state tree of Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee, and of course were the chosen leaf for Adkins Arboretum's logo, where many of these photos were taken. 2020 is the Arboretum's 50th anniversary, but many of its tulip trees are at least 100 years old. While enjoying the shade of a tulip tree on a sultry summer's day, Think of all the stories it might tell as the forest grew up around it. <laughs>